Well, today, I know we're in Mission 27, which is our journey through the 27 books of the New Testament. But I want you to go to Daniel. That's in the Old Testament. All right, I think you all know that. But go to the book of Daniel, chapter 10. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 10. That's where we're going to start today. Because what we have here, and it just so happens, I think this is really interesting. I just thought about this this morning as I was looking through my notes, that, that the VBS is actually in the book of Daniel, talking about Daniel and Babylon and everything. And so here we are. We're kind of all teeing it up together right here. Because what was going on in Babylon at the time was spiritual warfare. There was a lot going on in the spiritual realm. And Daniel understood that. And Daniel saw that his nation was in exile in Syria, and he wanted to deal with it. How did Daniel deal with it? He prayed. He prayed. And you know what? God heard him. He dispatched a heavenly agent to come and help Daniel. But a demonic prince of Persia obstructed the heavenly messenger. Check out this spiritual warfare. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Then he continued. He is that initial heavenly messenger that was sent to Daniel to answer his prayer. He continued. He said, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Stop right there and just realize something. God hears. When we pray, God hears our prayer. And God actually answers our prayers. That's incredible. So that's what was going on here. Daniel saw an issue. He brought it before the Lord in prayer. God heard it, and he sent a messenger. He took action on that, verse 13. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Resisted who? The heavenly angel, the agent who was coming to help Daniel. This prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, the archangel Michael, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. What do we see here? Daniel's praying, and there's a whole lot going on in the background. There are wars happening in the heavenlies, warring against one another. How was this spiritual battle ultimately dealt with? How was it dealt with? Well, the archangel or the angelic messenger finally gets help from the archangel Michael. That's where the help comes from. From who? From God, first of all, who sends the initial angel. That angel gets held up for 21 days by this demonic principality, Prince of Persia, in the heavenlies is going on, in the heavenly realms, this is happening. God sends the archangel Michael to break through that. That's what's going on. And then God showed Daniel what was happening in the heavenlies. But notice, God never charged Daniel with directly engaging in this battle. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare today. God never, never charged Daniel with dealing with the spiritual battle that was happening in in the heavenlies, was with those heavenly principalities. Rather, Daniel's role was to pray and ask God for help, and then God moved heaven and earth, as they say. You see that? Yet many Christians today, with this exact passage in Daniel chapter 10, have formulated whole spiritual warfare strategies based on these verses, believing that we ourselves because there are spiritual principalities and heavenly realms, that somehow it's our role to engage directly with them, to bind them, in order for us to be victorious. I'm stepping on toes. That's my job, y'all. I, I get paid for this, man, to step on toes. Look, check this out. I'm just going right for it, man. We're just hitting it right on today, okay? Look, check this out. Jesus didn't command us to go into all the nations to find demons and bind them. That's not the Great Commission, is it? Jesus said, go into all the nations and make disciples. Now, Jesus and his disciples, as they were doing the ministry of the kingdom, they never went looking for demons. Yet, demons would find them. And when a demon would show up, when Jesus was ministering or the disciples were ministering, what happened? 
They simply told the demon, shut up, sit down, and get out. And that was it. It was short and sweet whenever you read about these encounters. And then they would go about the business of the kingdom. I believe this is our model for us. Number one, get busy with our job of making disciples. And number two, if a demon literally shows up, we bind them in the name of Jesus, and we get right back to the business that we're called to of making disciples. So with all this backdrop from Daniel chapter 10, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 today. Title of today's message, it's time for Christians to take a stand. It's time for Christians to take a stand. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, so when you see a word like finally or therefore or, or these types of connector words, there's something that came before. So finally, meaning after all this other stuff that I've said here in, in, the, in this letter to you, Paul is saying, after talking in those first three chapters about, about how our vertical relationship with God is so important and how through Christ we have unity with God, understand it, know it, embrace it, live in it. And then number two, stage two of Ephesians, after understanding and living out unity and love for one another, finally, let's deal with this last topic, Paul is saying. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Whose mighty power? God's mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Point number one, the day of evil will come. And with that, we're going to close today. And I'm going to say, have a blessed day. <laughs> so point number one is we're looking at the spiritual warfare. What's it all about? How does it all go down? What's our role? Point number one, the day of evil will come. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Look, Christians aren't immune from the battle. We're not immune from the attacks. The day of evil will come. Jesus even promised us that in this life, you will have trouble. But I said a prayer 10 years ago. That means, that means God has to... To, to make sure that I don't have any troubles in my life, that everything's good. No, no, no. That's not the promises of God. The day of evil will come. I'd argue that, that the day that we said yes to Jesus, the day that we were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light is the day that we got a bullseye put right on us. Why? Because the kingdom of darkness hates the kingdom of light. Darkness hates light. And we're in a battle. From the beginning of time, this has all been a battle. And y'all, we changed sides. You know what I mean? We went from darkness to light. We changed sides. And the side that we left doesn't like that we left. We've drawn a line in the sand. We've chosen the side of righteousness. But I want to notice, I want us to see something here. Paul is saying that when the day of evil comes, notice, we don't go looking for the evil. Something very important. Again, back to the point that I made. Jesus did not give us the great commission to go into all the world, look for demons, and bind them. He didn't say go into all the world, look for troubles, look for principalities, go into a new community and go to the high place and start just railing against principalities and against demonic forces. He did not tell us to do that. 
He said, when the day of evil comes, in other words, it's going to come. You don't have to go looking for it. It will come. Troubles are coming. Don't look for the fight. So there's a couple things that we see right here at the beginning of Ephesians 6 in verse 13. We cannot be ignorant to the fact that evil is coming. And many of you, it's already come, and it's come again, and it's come again, and it will probably come again and again. The day of evil will come. But when the battle finds us, our job is to stand. That's point number two. So the day of evil will come, but our job is to stand. What are we supposed to do about it? Are we supposed to worry about it? Are we supposed to fret about it? Are we supposed to look for it? No. We're about the work of the kingdom. We're about making disciples. We're about preaching the gospel. We have beautiful feet. We are doing the work of God's kingdom. We are loving God, and we're loving others. Man, that's what we're doing. We're not looking for spiritual battles. We're not looking for the enemy. We're not giving him the time of day. He doesn't deserve it. We're about the business of God. We're looking in his beautiful, wonderful face. That's what we're doing, man. That's what we're about now. And we're not worried about it, the fact that we know that evil will come and that troubles are around the corner, as Jesus said. We're not worried about that because we're standing. We're standing. We're not shaking. We're not worried. We're not freaking out. We're not doing any of that stuff. We're standing. Therefore, verse 13, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. Here, one of the problems we have in our world today is Christians aren't standing. I mean, they're not. Christians haven't been standing, man. We're crumbling in such large numbers. So many Christians look so much like the world. And if that's you, come on now. It's time to put off that stuff and to put on the things of God now. Take off those old soiled drawers. You know what I'm saying, right, if you were here last week. Come on now. Get rid of them and put on the things of heaven. Too many Christians look too much like the world. Instead of standing on truth, they're buying into all this sexual, secular and sexual and all this woke ideologies and all this kind of stuff. And we're trying to marry it with, with the word of God and make it fit and, and so that we can just kind of seem like we're close enough to the world so that somehow we can relate to the world. Y'all, the kingdom of heaven should not relate to the kingdom of darkness. There's no relation to the two. There's zero relation. This world does not need a church that's going to bring them more of the world. This world needs a church that's going to bring them the exact opposite of this world, the kingdom of heaven. That's what this world needs. Christian marriages are crumbling because we're not standing. Children have been leaving the church in droves over the last 20, 30 years. Because we aren't standing. Prayer, the Bible kicked out of our public schools. We mock God. We abort our babies. We redefine marriage. And, and I'll be honest with you, man. I'm like, where has the church been in all this? Christians haven't been standing. But notice this. Standing comes after something. So what's our main response to to spiritual warfare, we're called to stand. We pray and we stand. We're going to see prayer coming up again here as we get to verse 18. But something comes before the standing. Ephesians 6, 13, having done all to stand. Having done all. You mean there's stuff to do as Christians? Yeah. There's a lot of doing. To do as believers. Not doing to gain our salvation. Man, that's been done. It is finished, man. We, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away. The new has come. I mean, we're cleansed. Our sin is as far as the east is from the west, man. God doesn't see it anymore. We even have new titles, man. We're not sinners according to God's word. 
Look through the New Testament to the saints. We're called saints now. We're not orphans, man. We've been adopted into the family of God through the blood of the Lamb, the work of, of the, the Son of God, Jesus himself. I mean, it is finished. It's done. But there's some doing to do. Not related to any of that. Having done all, stand. We don't drift around in life. We don't just kind of go, whatever will be, will be. I said a prayer, I'm going to heaven. Whatever happens, happens, whatever. What? Do you know Jesus? Is that how he did life? What we do or don't do matters. We all want to be in that place of standing. But there's something we must do first before we get to that place of standing. Pastor, are you telling me that my actions, my choices, how I spend my time, what I do with my life matters? That what I do or don't do affects like, like what's going to happen to me in my life right now and what's going to happen to others? And are you telling me that, that what I do will affect whether or not I can stand? Yes, I am. But I'm not telling you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Having done all, to stand. How we live our lives, what we put on, what we put into our lives every day will dictate whether or not we're going to stand when the day of evil comes. The day of evil is coming. Will we stand? Whether our families will stand, whether our marriages will stand, whether our nation will stand or fall into judgment. In, in, in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, he writes, Submit yourselves to the Lord Resist the devil and he will free from, flee from you. Two words right there. Submit. That's an action. That's something for us to do. Submit yourselves to God. And resist the devil. Do you know why we can resist the devil? It was impossible before Christ came into your life. You couldn't do anything but sin, 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 sin. And that's all we could do. We had no hope, man. We couldn't. We were not redeemed, man, but we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is inside of us. We have all we need for life and godliness. This is incredible what we have in Christ Jesus, and now we can do what was impossible to do before, and that's do something called resist the devil. And when we resist him, he will flee from us. So what are you doing? Have you done all things? We're going to talk about the armor of God. Have you put it on? Are you putting it on? Are you obeying God's word, walking in the spirit, not in the flesh? Are you praying in the spirit on all occasions? We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Are you gathering or are you forsaking the gathering? Have you done all or are you just rolling the dice and are you just kind of hoping for the best? It'll all work out in the end. And I'm not talking at this point like about your eternal security. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about if you don't just resist the devil this one time and somehow you fall back into sin. We're not talking about that. We're talking about spiritual warfare right now. This is the context. We're talking about the enemy coming to mess with you, to take you out to what, as, as, as Jesus said in John 10, 10, to rob, kill, and destroy. That's what we're talking about. So have you done all, or are you just hoping for the best? Point number three, standing requires preparation. So Paul tells us how to stand. This is how you stand. Verse 14, stand firm then with a belt of truth that's buckled. You know, I don't even, I don't even have this on. I'm preaching with this thing in here. How have you gotten anything from me on this? Were you guys hearing me? I just realized, why is all that scruffily happening? I'm like, I haven't put this on my ear yet. Spiritual warfare. I didn't do all. You know what I mean? I didn't put it over my ear. I, I mean, there was doing to do, and I didn't do it. That's Just stand. Just stand. Some of you are like, just stand and quit talking. You know, just... Just stand, please, Pastor. Woo! Now y'all can hear me. No more scruffling going on. 
So standing requires preparation. There's some things we need to do, like, you know, anyway. All right, so here's how we're to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is an always be ready call right here. This is not a one and done type of a deal. This is an always be ready. So we're told to stand this way. We're told to stand on truth. And he calls it like a belt, meaning it holds holds us up. You know what I mean? It keeps us covered. There's two options. We can either live by lies, which is what the world wants us to do, and that's going to bring death. Or we can live by truth, and that will bring life. We have to know truth and speak truth. How do we stand? We know truth, and we speak truth truth. We don't entertain lies. We don't play around with lies. We have the belt of truth on. That's how we stand. That's how we deal with it when the day of evil comes. We got truth. The second thing is we have righteousness, and it guards us like a breastplate. What what does a breastplate cover up? The vital organs. Your heart. Exactly. And how do we protect our heart? By making right choices, by living righteously, by saying no to ungodliness and, and, and yes t- to God's way. You know who gets a lot of damage in their heart? People who sin a lot. You know who gets a lot of damage in their heart in a marriage? People who cheat on their wife creates a lot of, of, of damage. You know what protects all of that? Righteousness. The righteousness of Christ that we have that's been given to us, but then the righteousness that we then live out because we have the grace of Jesus Christ at work in our lives. And that's a daily thing. It's not a one and done thing. It's a new way of life, a new way of living. That breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, which is that power unto salvation, the gospel. Faith is like a shield. We trust God. And it protects us from the fiery darts that Satan is throwing at us. Salvation is like that helmet. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 says, Paul speaks of the hope of salvation. Always living in that understanding of what Christ has done for us. Protects our minds against things like fear and despair and worry. We know who we are and whose we are. We don't worry about that. And then there's the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. God's Word does not return void. Jesus was being tempted by the devil. The same armor, the same sword he used, we are called to use. We speak truth. We speak his word, and he will flee. And he will flee. Lies cannot stand up against truth. Not in the end. And we don't just pray on the armor of God. I know some people are like, man, this is a rough week. I just got to pray on the armor. Oh, God, I just pray that I have this. I just pray. Y'all, that is not, we are called to put on the armor of God. Putting it on, meaning we choose to live this way. This is how we live. These are the practices of our lives. Truth. Righteousness. God's word. Living out of that place of being saved by Jesus and being his ambassadors on this earth now. We we live out of that place that, that we share the gospel of Jesus. We put it on every single day. We don't pray it on. Here's, here's what it looks like, people, when they, when, they, when they think it's just about praying it on. It's like the, the bad guy comes to your door. It's 2 a.m. in the morning, he comes to your door, and you go, you go to the front door, he breaks it open, 
And you're like, wait, 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 wait. I've got a gun. It's in my safe. Can you just wait for a little bit? I'm going to go get that. Then I'm going to come back. And then we're going to deal with the situation. Meanwhile, you go get it. You come back. You go, wait. It's not loaded. Um, can you just give me a little bit more time to go? No, no. There's some people in this church who I appreciate, responsible people, people who um, have made it a lifestyle of being prepared and ready for the day of evil. And this is a different kind of, of being armed, if you will, of, of daily caring and, and daily having, you know, something to be able to deal with evil. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm talking about carrying, carrying a sidearm. There are folks that, I mean, I hope, anyway, I'm okay with that. But, and I appreciate those in this church who do because it's just, it's, you're, you're here to protect the rest of us. And I appreciate that. But here's how they do it. They do it every day. The people who are serious about this, who are like, you know what, I feel responsible that if the day of evil comes that I'm going to be able to stop it and deal with it. They, they daily carry. They're daily locked and loaded. They're not wondering if, they're, if, if, if their magazine is loaded or not. They know it's loaded because it's a habit. It's, it's what they do. They're prepared. They're trained. And they're alert. And they're ready for the day of evil. And that's maybe just a little bit of picture of how we need to be as the people of God. We need to put on the armor of God. We need to put on truth. We need to have this. This needs to be every single day we live with these things. This is how we live life. And so we're not worried about it. And we're trained in it, by the way. I think that's an important aspect of it. We're prepared and we're trained. We know how to live as the people of God. Of God. But there's one more thing that often gets left out as we talk about spiritual warfare, specifically the armor of God and what we're supposed to do when the day of evil comes. That final component is point number four it's praying in the Spirit. So put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. Let me go back to verse 18, or verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and, notice the connector there, and, this is not something separate from standing in the midst of spiritual warfare and the battles that are going on around us. This is not something separate from being prepared and safe and ready for when the day of evil comes. This is connected with everything else that we read. Another critical component of how we, the people of God, stand when there's all kinds of crazy spiritual warfare happening. And in verse 18, Paul writes, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And I want to jump back. Think about it. Isn't this what Daniel did? In the midst of the day of evil coming, in the midst of spiritual warfare happening, he was praying. He was praying. You look at Daniel's life also when you see a man that was wearing God's armor. You see a man that was standing in faith, in righteousness, in his position in the Lord, trusting God, knowing who God is. And you see a man who was praying. He was praying. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus taught us that we must watch and pray so that we don't fall into temptation. We know that we have the sword of the Spirit, but this weapon of praying in the Spirit is another extremely powerful weapon that we cannot leave behind. It's part of what God has given us to stand. It's like we have the sword of the Spirit in one hand and the praying in the Spirit in the other. And look out, we're standing, we're standing.
two powerful weapons. I want to tell a story. I told this years ago. Maybe some of you have heard this, but this is just an example of, of when the day of evil comes and how we can respond to the day of evil. So I was over in California, in Riverside, California, at a basketball tournament uh, when I used to coach high school basketball, and it was a homeschool team. We were in a tournament over in, in California playing a bunch of California teams. Um, they were, they were homeschool teams, Christians, but I don't know. California Christians are different than, you know, real Christians, I think, a little bit. But um, anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But um, y'all can handle a joke here and there, can't you? You don't hear many jokes from me, I know. And some of you are like, I don't think we ever hear a joke from you. That Anyway, but that's a, anyway. So we were over in California at a basketball tournament, and I was there with, with Hannah, Tim, Tim Brooks' wife, Hannah, Tim leads our worship, typically my son Ben led today, but, but um, anyway, Hannah was over there, uh, Hannah's dad was over there, Hannah was back here with Tim in Arizona, and she goes into labor. But everything started going wrong. There, there was a time of distress, and it was a full-out emergency, and the call came in, and Dave shared with me, this is the call I got. And, and it, it was panic time. It really was kind of that panic moment uh, during this birth as 911 is called and all kinds of things are going on. And so Dave and I begin to pray. And we begin to pray and pray. And then we start just sensing that there is something going on, like in the heavenlies, like there's fiery darts of the enemy that are being shot at this little boy who is Samuel, by the way, who is now, how old is he, 10, 8? 10, 20, 30, okay, he's going to be 10, 20, 30 pretty soon. He's nine, uh, praise God. But, but, but we just sensed this, and so we started praying into this, and we just started asking God to just, just deal with every single one of those arrows. And next thing you know, we're walking around the hotel that we were standing and, and staying in, and, and we just started praying, and we run out of things to even know how to pray, and we just begin praying in the Spirit. We're praying in English, and then we're just praying in, in tongues, and in other we just were praying in groans and crying out to God in this time of need because the day of evil had come in this moment. And the result was, is that Samuel was born healthy, and he's a healthy nine-year-old right now. He's rambunctious, sharp, he's got it all together, and his future is bright in Christ Jesus. And one of the ways that we deal with the day of evil is we pray. And God chose to encourage us to pray in the Spirit. And today I want to give us an opportunity just to ask that God would lead us into this even more and open up our eyes more of what this means to be people who stand and who are praying in the Spirit on all occasions. So I just want you to posture yourself even just in a place of just, of just interacting with God right now. Just quiet yourself before the Lord right now. I'm going to lead us in some prayer right now, but this is really between you and God. And the prayer that I'm going to lead is going to be one of asking to understand more of what it means to pray in the Spirit. And I'm going to ask God to just pour out the gift of prayer in our lives in greater and greater measure. Because it's an important part of the Christian life. It's an incredible aspect of how we engage with the living God. It was from the beginning of time, from the days of Daniel, to the days of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, to us today. Prayer. So Lord, we come to you right now. God, and we recognize our need for you. And Lord, you, you've encouraged us. You've told us to stand, and you've given us righteousness, and you've given us peace, and you've given us the gospel. You've given us salvation. You've given us truth. You've given us your word, Lord God. You've given us everything we need to stand, and you've said now, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. And Lord, we ask 
that you would help us walk into that reality more and more. God, teach us more and more how to pray in the Spirit. To pray in our own language, to pray in other languages, to pray with groans, God. Just those those different ways that you've explained that that praying in the Spirit and with our minds and in all different ways as you even said here in Ephesians 6, God. All the different ways that you've called us to pray in the Spirit, God. Would you lead us into those? God, if you have something for us, I'm saying... Yes and amen to it. If you say that there is something that you've given me that helps me stand, then God, I want it and I want to grow in it. God, teach me. Teach us. Expand, God, our prayer life. We eagerly desire thank you Jesus thank you Jesus you know I just want to say from a from a pastoral perspective that this is how we interact with God when we see something that God has in his word for us We simply humble ourselves before him and we ask for it. I don't need to impart upon you the ability to pray in the Spirit. It's something God has given you. The the Holy Spirit has indwelt you. If you're born again in Christ Jesus, Christ has baptized you in the Spirit. You can ask for the fullness of that that he has for you in the Spirit. If you want to go further into praying in the Spirit, whether that's praying with your mind or praying with the Spirit or praying in English or praying in tongues, whatever it might look like, whatever it might be, as as Paul said here, let's go back to it, with all kinds of prayers and requests, Ephesians 6, 18, all kinds, just ask. As it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and in 14, 39, eagerly desire those gifts that the Holy Spirit has for you. These things aren't for some other believer, but not for you. They're for all of us who are in Christ Jesus. He's given you all you need for life and godliness. Ask. I want to cover one more topic, though. I feel like... I. I'm going I'm to cover this last topic because I think it's important. I want to do things God's way. And, you know, sometimes we, we get excited, okay? How many of you get excited about things and then you just kind of push the envelope a little bit? And, you know, how many of you have kids who, would get, who get excited and kind of push the envelope a little bit, right? And we do things out of zeal. We do things out of excitement. We, you know, and... and, and um, and we can do that as Christians, and that's okay, but, but I just want to recognize maybe when, when I'm just doing something out of excitement versus doing something that maybe God has called me to do or how God's called me to do it. And as I was just processing spiritual warfare, and I just, I just want to share this. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, told us to pray. He told us to pray. He told us to fast also. But I'm going, to cover this, I'm going to cover this gently. I'm not saying any of this is, is, this is just what I'm processing right now, so hear me, okay? And that is that Jesus told us to pray. We're told throughout Scripture to pray. But Jesus told us to pray. He didn't tell us to decree. In 1 Timothy 2.1, it tells us to pray for all those, especially our leaders. Not to decree things over our leaders. God, answers Dan, God answered Daniel's prayers. There was no decreeing involved in anything that Daniel was doing in this this warfare as he's crying out to God for a change and a release to happen. 
It's praying and not decreeing that's the biblical instruction as we truly read what God's word has, has prescribed for us, his people, to do. And I'm sharing this, I mean, humbly, can I, I just want to do what God's called me to do. And I want to interact with the living God on his terms. I don't want to take something and, and make a doctrine out of, out of zeal, out of something. God answers our faith-filled prayers, not our demands. He answers our prayers. When somebody had an issue with something in the Bible, they prayed and God showed up and God moved and God delivered. Prayer is what will bring change. Prayer is what will change nations. We need change in our nation. And you know the passage of Scripture we typically use as we are looking at how is this change going to happen. It's 2 Chronicles 7.14. And check out once again what I'm talking about here. It's written, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. No change is happening in this nation until the body of Christ is humbled, first of all. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and what? Pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then what will happen? Then God says, then I, God, will hear from heaven, and I, God, will forgive their sin, and I, God, will heal their land. God says that he will hear from heaven the prayers of his people and heal their land. So I just share this because, again, I want to do things God's way. I don't want to yell at the devil when the Bible doesn't tell me to yell at the devil. Just because I'm full of zeal and I'm full of faith and I'm full of, of God's grace and all that, I want to do what God's called me to do. Because God's ways work. They're the right way. And I want to honor him in that. And so I just share that humbly. I shared it with some hesitation because I know that there are different practices in the body of Christ. And, but as, as I pastor this church and as I fearfully study the Word of God and, and want to, I feel like I need to share what God is showing me and what He's convicting me of. And to not do that would be to not pastor and um, so I, I throw that out there humbly, and I, I encourage you to seek God's word in that particular thing. Don't just look at that and go, listen to me and go, well, man, the pastor says this, and, and I, I got other thoughts on that. Well, go to God's word and look at it. And let me share this also. And I share this in a daily dose, which more y'all need to get subscribed to right now with notifications. But one of the things is this. If y'all ever hear something I say and you're like, man, what is, what is up with him? I don't know if I agree with that. Please don't just write me off. Come talk with me. And let's talk these things through. And let's, let's, let's have unity in the spirit and love for one another. And let's seek the Lord on this together and process this together. See, this is what the body of Christ is supposed to be about. It's about us doing life close enough to where we actually wrestle with things together. We don't find a wrestling match and run no, we engage in this together, and we work through things together because we want God's best for us. That's doing life as the body of Christ. So anyway, we're in a spiritual battle. We have a role to play. What's our role? Our role is to stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. I want to end with Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed the powers and authorities. Who did this? Jesus did. We don't disarm the powers and authorities. Jesus has done that. It is finished. And Colossians 2.15 says, And having done this, having disarmed the powers and authorities, He, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So, that's my quick synopsis on some spiritual warfare. That's us trying to process how do we engage in, a, in an environment where there's wars going on in the heavenlies. What's our role in all this? 
what, what are we supposed to do and what are we not supposed to do? And I want to say this as I close on this. Our primary job and role right now, I would say, is to love God and to love others. And we love God and we love others by doing what he told us to do. And the primary thing that he's told us to do is to go into all the world, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples, teaching them to obey all that he's commanded. So let's be about the main thing. And when the day of evil comes, man, Jesus is with us. We are fully fitted with the armor of God. And we are people growing in the understanding of praying in the Spirit. And we don't need to fear. We don't need to fear. If God is for you, who or what can be against you? And with that, let's stand up. You know, one way that we deal with, with issues in our lives is that we bring it before the Lord. And God tells us that we're to pray for one another. We're to pray for one another. So if you've got an issue in your life, I want to invite the prayer ministers to come forward. I want to invite you to come and ask one of your brothers or sisters in the Lord to come alongside of you and, and to pray and believe with you and for you. This is one of the things God's given us of how we deal with life. But I also want to just I want to talk with anybody who came into this room and, and you are far from God. It's no accident that you're here. There's been a battle going on. Jesus, the Son of God, said this, and I mentioned it earlier in John 10.10. 10. The enemy has come to rob, kill, and destroy. And maybe you can go, yeah, I get that. That's been happening in my life ever since I was born. Yeah. But then Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and that to the full. He's calling you into that life that's found in him, that new life that's found in him. Where you're no longer alone, wondering and worrying, but you're secure in who you are in Christ Jesus. You're secure today and tomorrow, you become a new creation. The old passes away and the new comes. The biggest battle that goes on is the battle for your soul, for our souls. And today I'm praying is the day of victory for you. So I want to encourage you to come and just share with one of these prayer ministers your desire to walk into new life that's found in Jesus. They'll pray with you. They'll share with you. They'll rejoice with you. And today will be your day of walking out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And I just pray that, that this week, that every one of us here in this congregation would learn a little bit more of what it means to stand. To stand on the rock. Christ Jesus, to stand fully fitted with the armor of God and to pray in the Spirit. Get into Ephesians this week. Read the whole book through again, but really, in Ephesians chapter 6. Seek the Lord. Pray through that. Ask God what it means for your life to put on each one of those elements of the armor. And pray. Pray. Remember what we learned from Daniel today. He prayed. God heard him. And he took action. There was a delay. Maybe there's a delay in the answer to your prayers and your cries to God. God knows. He's heard. He's not forgotten. Continue to be like Daniel. And bring your needs, your cares, your hurts, your pains to him. Because he cares for you. God bless, enjoy life in Christ Jesus today, and share it with others. Amen? Amen. Hey, it's going to get hot this week. I'm just saying, that's just a little extra credit.